So this is how democracy dies, with thunderous applause. I'm quoting episode 3. I'm thinking of movies better than this, and I'm resorting to the Star Wars prequels. Yeah. Game over, man. Game over. I'm surprised that we're, well, technically sitting, but we made it. We made it to the end of Gundam Sea Destiny, the movies, and we have tried, we have, as you may have listened to our previous reviews, we pointed out the good, we pointed out the bad. There was no good in this movie. We've honestly trying to be fair with it, and it has not been fair to us. It was painful and and cruel. I yeah. hurt. <laughs> I hurt like. Uh, so let's... we're gonna try and get through this nice and quick, and then wrap up with an epilogue. So much like the other uh, two C Destiny movies before, after the first, we're thrown right into the middle of a fight. So if you like watch the the movies apart from each other, you might be a little lost. You might not remember that the fight for Orb was still going on. Well, yep. it is. Yeah, it's still going on. Um, so we get Kigali, start with Kigali, like, uh, running up, getting out of her mech, and running in, as I jokingly put, because the show has no respect for women, she was running back to the kitchen. Unfortunately, she was going to punch some dude in the face. Yuna, no less, which was very satisfying. And it kind of just goes downhill from there. Yeah, the uh, orb is getting bombarded. And uh, and we actually think the, the orb council gets crushed by falling debris. And, like, there's, like, a second clip of someone in that kind of outfit. And then they get crushed. So, Kagali might be the sole person in charge from now on. Oh, boy. Good for her, I guess. Um, the, uh, uh, the battle continues between, uh, well, Kira gets a little bit of support when, uh, Athrin shows up in Infinite Justice, and, well, we see the beginning of Shin's fall. Yep, we, Athrin confronts Shin right away, and instantly he's like, wait, aren't you dead? Which is great, because right now, Shin's kill count, as far as main characters, is, like, Zero? He got Owl. Okay. He still got Owl. <laughs> and, uh, oh yeah, and he's Shining Fingered uh, Sting. That's true. So the Extendeds, he's at a uh, pretty good death rate on the Extendeds. Two for three. And the third one, well, he was involved in that. He was involved in it? He's not too proud of that one. Not though. too proud of that one. So, uh, Athern, of course, asks Shin, like, is this what he really wanted? Because he's in Orb, he's blowing the place apart. And, and Athrun's trying to call him out on it. Uh, in the meantime, uh, Yuna actually kind of gets away from his guards, only to be squashed by... A goof. A falling goof just crushes him. Couldn't have happened to a nicer guy. I know. That yeah. was satisfying. Darn shame. <laughs> so, uh, then Ray shows up to break in on Athrun and Shin's conversation... With more or less, how dare you think about something that I don't think about? <laughs> and, and we keep getting Shin thinking about uh, something that Ray told him about how you can't, you don't have the ability to protect anything. And little flashbacks to everyone that he's ever failed to protect, which always pushes him over the edge. And, uh. Shin and tries to go mad dog but is literally disarmed by Athrun. who can finally fight again it's been a while yeah i don't know if he just he left his like piloting skill in the cockpit of justice but having it back has made him really good for some reason whatever and and in the middle of all of this uh jabril the the actual guy that uh zaf came to get it actually sneaks out and launches up into space. Luna is sent to uh, take him out. Good idea, guys. Um, Maybe if they sent out the impulse in full 
you know, instead of in separate parts, she would have gotten there faster. Yeah, maybe Ooh, she nice. could have, you know, launched as a Gundam instead of having to do the combination sequence, but she does. It's in her contract. She has to have that anim animation at least six times per movie. And more impressively, she manages to fly faster than the uh, Murasame units. In plane mode. In plane mode, which is odd. Whatever. I don't even... Well, needless to say, Jabril actually makes it all the way to space. And, uh, and Talia, the captain of the Minerva, uh, does the nice thing and orders her forces to retreat, quote-unquote, because they were there to find Jabril, not to wantonly promote war and orb. Which, Which is nice. uh, disappointed, uh, uh Durandal, though. <laughs> yeah, he was kind of hoping they wiped the place out. Uh, af after the, the fight is all over, Kigali goes on the air and makes a statement about uh, the past events. Or at least she was going to make a statement until she gets interrupted by Double D Lacus. Yay, the fake Lacus talks on and on about how they're using child soldiers and despicable means, honestly like their own army that she's supporting. Let's say, we, we were talking about the Minerva crew in a previous <laughs> video. <laughs> But it turns out, you know, the real Lacus happened to be in the neighborhood and joined Kigali's presentation. So she interrupts Double D Lacus's broadcast. And obviously, for anyone who wasn't too sure, this is the Lacus with the correct, correct bus size, in case there was any dispute on which one was the real one. And I, once again, we've stated before, and it's remained true, Lacus is God and full of our, our sheep. sheep. Everyone just is like, all right, it's Lacus, we should listen to her. Which one is the real one? I don't know which one to blindly follow. Actually, yeah. people's crisis. The saddest part of this has got to be that among the people reacting like this is Shin, who is not only always um, attached to Luna now, but is asking Ray how to think. This is, I think we could start here with our signs of the apocalypse, because obviously it's got to happen in this movie. Ray becomes the go-to guy for anything. Everyone, I can't even say looks up to him as much as just blindly follows everything he says. It's true. Um, there's nothing that the other characters even in Zaft even, like, think about anymore aside from uh gilbert of course it's just hey what does ray think and then shin and luna follow it uh i'll go with what ray says in fact that's a line later on that shin gives it, it it's just very frustrating it, it's a you know the last video we were talking about kind of how the dynamic was shifting from athrin as the uh mentor character to ray and the difference being that Ray isn't a mentor. He's got these guys under his spell, essentially. They just do what he says and have lost all characters of their own. Mm -hmm. um, Character assassination, it's pretty much all over in this movie. There's Everyone has just been reduced to their most base forms. Everything that we liked about Shin is pretty much gone now. He's just Ray's puppet. Which is great, because we're about ten minutes in, and that happened. That hurts. Um, and then we look at other characters. I mean, Kira and Lacus have been elevated to demigod status. Everything yeah. they say and do is completely right. Scripture, even. And God, do they preach. They're... they're... We see them at least three times give sermons on their ships to to their crew, which is great. It's preaching to the choir. <laughs> and, and, I mean, everyone just sits there and listens to it. They just take it. Don't question it. That because it's God. But uh, speaking of assassinations, we get Mir, who's slowly realizing that Athrun was completely right in saying that as soon as she's completely useless to Drandal, he's going to get rid of her. And what do you know, as soon as Lacus makes the broadcast, Mir gets shipped off to space. So, in the meantime, Jabril uh, made it all the way to the moon, and 
has set up there with the last of the logos team, which was you know uh, I, like an Earth Alliance. I guess it was the Earth Alliance. I'm I, not sure. They have the out like the uniforms. They have the uniforms and the mobile suits. So we'll just say that we'll they are. We'll just say that they are on the moon. That's fun. And um and they decided to use their giant moon cannon. The Requiem cannon. The most completely overly complicated super weapon I think I have ever seen. Now, it, it's one thing to make like a super cannon in the moon. It's another thing to make a super cannon on the dark side of the moon that fires and then you have to redirect it through colony cylinders. Like five cylinders they had to redirect this thing through. It was very silly. And, uh, well, they decided to take their first shot with it and attack the, uh, the plant's capital. Uh, was it... Aprilius. Aprilius. And, uh, and once again, we see a very stunning, powerful, destructive scene with people just, uh, like, civilians dying in the millions, most likely. Oh. It's like you said, this show is good at, if this show's good at one thing, it's tearing things apart. Got it? Yeah. Yeah. See what we did there? Yeah. Okay. We're so, clever. <laughs> uh, this was also like one of the first times we see Durandal show more emotion than a blank face. And so we first see him get shocked, and then we see him pissed. And He's... that's very interesting. His facade is almost completely gone at this point. He's just like, get rid of that thing now. I am angry. And so they launch their full-scale assault on the moon. So it's the Earth Alliance uh, being led by the Logos team, specifically Jabril, versus the plants. The uh, Minerva manages to get to space really fast, incidentally. Yeah, they do. Yeah, um, this fight goes on. Uh, and honestly, th this is part of this last movie that it kind of hurts us to say, but... We didn't care about the fights in this movie. These battles are completely uninteresting. I don't know what it is about them, but there's no stakes. It, I mean, even when... with I Clearly there are stakes, but it doesn't feel like it. I don't even care. Like, we see, you know, hundreds of ships getting blown up and suits and everything, but we never actually get to see, like, how the loss of said ships and suits affects the the military unit as a whole mm -hmm. we never hear anyone panicking about like oh the fourth wave just got wiped out it's not like macross where you're down to only the skull squadron or like uh like in uh the original gundam when uh when Giran fires his uh colony laser mm -hmm. and then the fleet goes into a panic and then everyone has to rally around whiteface like that was really scary and we have you know, another giant space cannon wiping things out, and... It's, yeah, I guess there goes back to Gundam. How many giant space cannons can we really have wiping things out? Um, we also get a hint at the Destiny plan, finally. And what it turns out to be is this kind of plan where they pick your Destiny... Eh, see what they did there? Uh from birth so basically they design you with your genes and to to perform some task in your future and that's what you're gonna do no question no question simplify the, the uh they react to that we finally go to the moon we uh, uh also during this uh moment we we get a lot more of Athrin and um Oh, sorry, not Ethan. Shin and uh, Luna? Luna hanging out together, and they're still really huggy, and we're still really convinced they're just doing it for the sex. Well, one of the the games that kind of kept us going through this movie <laughs> was to decide who's getting the sex. <laughs> because... it, it's sad, but we had to. We had to. It... Like this movie was just so uninteresting that we had to come up with something and and what was in one interesting thing that i kind of came across or just a concept that intrigued me was the idea that 
you know, how Ray has, like, taken over all these people's lives on the Minerva, I just get the feeling he set up Luna with Shin. Or vice versa, if, in a more creepy sense, he set up Shin with Luna mm-hmm. as a way for him to manage his emotions. And as horrible as that sounds... It, uh, that's what it feels like. Like, Luna was this sex object. It's terrible, but it's the only thing I can come up with for what the, the movie her gave purpose her, is. The movie gave her no personality at all. Like, I, we didn't spend any time with Luna. I don't remember her having anything in the TV series either, though. Like, if I'm asked to describe a character in Gundam and not describe what mobile suit they pilot... I can't come up with any. Uh, again, character assassinations, even if they weren't there to begin with. Uh-huh. Um, we also get to cut to Senator Durandal oh, in boy. his Palpatine chair. He's not a senator, but... Oh, uh, Lord. He rocks that chair. He's got... the the uh, Zaft has this base called Messiah. It's got a super, it's got a Genesis 2 cannon on it, so an, another cannon like the one that uh, Atherin's daddy had, and it has a Palpatine throne room, complete with the Palpatine window and the Palpatine chair. We're not even kidding, like, if the lights were on in Star Wars, in that room, like they had the lights turned on, it would be this room. It was the Return of the Jedi throne room, like... It just was. Even down to the windows on the sides of the throne. The throne itself is the same shape. And he spins around in it. <laughs> Good. <laughs> you want this, don't you? <laughs> but but again, uh, going back to the fight that's apparently going on, unfortunately we still don't really care about. Uh, we see Luna actually can fight. Yeah, she actually shoots down a couple mechs, which was... Cool. Yeah. Rare. And uh, and they they make this mad dash to take out the giant laser cannon on the moon. Um, in in the meantime, mostly it's yeah it's mostly Shin and Luna are attacking the weapon. Ray, um, interesting uh, enough, is kind of just sitting back watching them go in. He launches a couple funnels, but mostly he's just kind of like man. And I think part of it is, uh, I think he was waiting for, uh, Debril actually decides to leave the base early to try and sneak away. And, in fact, in the ship that Neo Roanoke started out the movie, like, the original Episode 1 movie. Yeah, I remember when we were talking about how that thing just disappeared? We found it! It finally came back. It was hiding on the moon. Not for long. Then it gets blown up. Jabril gets DBZ'd. Just, like phased out. Like, if you've ever seen anyone get hit with the spirit bomb on uh, DBZ, that's pretty much what happens to him. And, uh, Not even kidding. And then they all live happily ever after. Honestly, I don't even remember if they they didn't blow up the giant cannon. They didn't blow up the giant cannon, they just declared victory. They just declared victory. Because they blew up Jabril real good. Yeah, and it was like, that was the end of that fight. That giant climactic fight between Logos and the plants. Oh, you know what we forgot to mention? There were more mass production destroy Gundams. Yeah. That got taken out. Because that, you know, made them, you know, more worthwhile. I, I don't even know why they bothered. I really don't. It, it was just like, oh, more destroy Gundams, and, well, that wasn't threatening yeah, at all. Yeah, they've got goofs in space. So, after all this has happened, um... Orbs decides to help Archangel get back into the fight. So they've got their troops all, all uh, you know, rallied up to, to form the, uh, the Three Ships Alliance, which was formed by the Archangel crew. Mm-hmm. The Kusanagi and the Eternal, originally. Yeah. They send a bunch of Kusanagi-class ships with them, though. Or... Well, things that look like the Kusanagi. I don't remember what class they are, but whatever. There's also, continuing with the character assassination, and we're not sure about this one, we'll get to it by the end in more detail, Kigali and Athrin split at, at this moment. Uh, Kigali, who actually has, had been wearing their engagement ring for the longest time, took it off 
and put it in a drawer. And and even even Kira like like asked Atherin, he's like, are you sure you just want to let Kigali go off because she's going back to manage Orb and everything? You break her heart, I'll break your face. <laughs> Why didn't he break his face? He should have. Uh, Asshole. Atherin re- replies with, uh, you know, right now it's better for us to take our time, and. And uh, let's let things settle down. So he's kind of still optimistic. Interestingly enough, when Kagali's further down this hallway and runs into Marin, uh, she tells her to take care of Athrun for her. Is is Athrun getting to sex? Athrun may be getting to sex. Oh. In space without Kagali. Oh. But anyway. This show's for Kitty. I, the part that we uh, missed, but I really do like, um, and by like, I mean the animation was nice, was like, oh. Atherin and Kira are talking, and... D- during a- one of the sermons. During one of the sermons, and uh, Atherin's like, I think it's time I join you guys. And then Kira gives him this high five, and they're like, yeah, we're putting the band back together. Buddy Cops, Kira and Atherin, Yeah! Like, that is the closest thing to... Cute dare. Like, that's one of the only things I could enjoy, was the that the animation of a high-five looked good. Yeah, it did. I hate this movie. <laughs> um, about this time... Like, we also noticed that all of our main characters, despite... Or, or the... Like, Atherin, Kira, uh... Lacus, Especially Lacus. During all this time, you know, horrible things are happening around them. I mean, a plant just got taken out. Big time. Two plants, because that, that one, they crashed the one into smashed time. into the other one. Again, they're really good at tearing things apart in this show. They always... The, that crew always has this self-righteous, happy look on their face. Uh, we're going to fix everything soon, no worries. We've got God on our side. <laughs> Oh, and Kigali entrusts the uh, goofy gold thing to uh, Moo. Moo. Oh, Moo. Who still thinks he's Neo uh, Roanoke. Yeah, he still thinks that. But at this time, uh, the the Archangel got back up into space. And they decided to stop at a colony. The moon. Pla- they stopped on the moon? moon. Oh, okay. Yeah, they, they, they made it to the moon. They're whalers on the moon. <laughs> uh, and... And go wandering around in a mall somewhere. Because there's plenty of time for shopping right now. Because Marin needs new clothes and Lacus needs new clothes. I was oh. surprised that she wasn't wearing giant sunglasses. Because <laughs> that makes you completely invisible to the paparazzi. Uh, it worked for Minmay. It can work for anyone. Just, just gonna say. But we get this Haro that comes up with a note in its mouth. And disappointingly, this was something that they fixed from the TV show. And I say disappointingly because it says to Miss Lacus, Help, I'm going to be killed, Mir. Now, why this is disappointing to me was because in the TV series it said, To Miss Lacus, help, I'm going to killed. <laughs> I love English. It's wonderful. The, the, the bee just ruined the fun of that scene. Again, we're grasping at straws for things to keep us interested. Um, so, we get this uh, showdown, so to speak, at this... Uh, it was like a play. It was like an, uh, yeah, an theater. outdoor theater. Yeah, uh, like old Greek style. And Double D Lacus is there waiting for them. Atherin immediately pulls a gun on her. <laughs> Because Atherin is a man of action, as this scene will shortly uh, show us. Some assassins have been sent to take out the real Lacus. So they they set up Mir as kind of the decoy slash bait um, to get Lacus out. And Mir, like at this time, she kind of has an existential meltdown about still wanting to be Lacus. And she she's losing track of who she is. Um, they're trying to shoehorn a character in here. Yeah. And, and honestly, it's, it's too much too late. Or even too little too late. It's a little bit of both, cause... That's all. Yeah, I... But the emphasis is on too late. Like, personally, I, I'm a very empathetic person, so I could get attached to Mir's character 
easily because that's just who I am. But honestly, it it is not set up well, and especially in the series. Pretty much her entire backstory is explained in this one episode where, spoiler, she gets shot during this fight. Uh, a gunfight breaks out between the assassins and our heroes. Athrin does some pretty ridiculous moves. He goes out there, he's all, pow, 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 pow. He's like jumping and stuff. He is a, he should be the new James Bond. As you say. Yeah, yeah, Athrin Bond. Zala, Athrin Zala. Running around shooting everybody. Um, but Mir is killed during this firefight, and, uh, in the scene, Athrin's crying horribly, Blackus is crying. Both horribly in that it was also animated really badly. <laughs> yeah. Kira, interestingly enough, he is kind of standing there aloof, completely emotionless. Kira's been reacting to a lot of deaths that way recently, I... It was kind of weird. Uh... Um, but again... They offered to take Mir away, though, to their credit. They they were willing to forgive her. Yeah, they they were totally willing to take her along, and this fight broke out, and she took a bullet for Lacus. She does a little pirouette when she dies. But honestly, there goes a character that we didn't get to know. Um, we get a speech from Durandal again, which you've heard me actually quote before. His whole speech on... How we made a promise that we wouldn't do do these horrible things again. To which we respond by doing them again. So his plan is he just makes the destiny plan clear to everybody and starts like, hey, you can sign up to have your genes uh like uh, qualified for what you're good enough to do, and that's what you're doing for the rest of your life. And and it's interesting, like a lot of people are shocked by this plan, especially. The people in his own army. The Minerva crew, for instance. The captain. Who has been sleeping with this guy? She was getting to sex from him. <laughs> and and she gets this plan. She's blown away by it. She has no idea what to think. Uh, everyone else, the Shin, of course, goes to Ray. He's like, what, what's the chairman thinking? Of course, Ray responds, uh, like... You, you know what the chairman was planning all along. He, he's been telling you all about this, you know, dream world that he hopes to create. To which we respond in place of Shin. Well, he gave me a suit. I kind of didn't listen to anything he had to say. Which, I was just happy to get a new suit. Which, amazingly, the animation then actually cut to the scene of him getting the new suit. Like the kid in the candy store. He was not paying attention to a word Durandal said. It was great. So now Durandal's plan is made public to everyone, and we get some more preaching, I think. Yeah, a little bit more. We find out a lot more motivation on Ray's part, that he is, in fact, a clone of um, Rao Le Creuset. Bum, bum, bum. Not that he looked exactly like uh, Rao, so not really surprising. Well, then he wouldn't be a very good clone, would he, Mr. Azum? <laughs> I'm just saying, not... Not a huge shocker. And he he started popping pills like Rao, which he has not done before now. So that this was, was the first time we saw him do that. That was silly. Yeah. Um, and he gives this big speech to Shin about how being a clone, he, he has a shortened lifespan. And so he's trying to create this dream world with Durandal so that... You know, it's, uh, suffering and all these bad things don't have to happen ever again. And, I, and so we... horrible lab experiments like him don't happen again. Yeah, so we we can kind of see where he's come from. He's got legitimate reasons. So, the, but again, this is so late in the game <laughs> to find out what is driving him as a character. Well, we were saying before, we didn't even really notice Ray much until the like the third movie i mean he had that freak out at the extended labs in movie two mm -hmm. but really i mean his part has not been that important until these last couple movies and i really feel like it was that way in the tv series too mm -hmm. as the story keeps moving along we get more revelations on the giant space base that the cannon is still operational so, so Zaft actually has two super weapons now. 
They own two Death Stars. Seriously. They look like the Death Stars. Unfortunately, they're, they're not particularly threatening. No. I, I mean, like, the stakes still don't feel high, which is impressive because when Durandal finds out that Orb and Scandinavia, oddly enough... Yep, specifically Scandinavia did not approve of his bill to be destined for stuff. He decides to demonstrate what will happen to people who don't agree and blows up a city on the moon. Which is interesting, because, you know, he fires from one side of the moon, it reflects back and hits the other side. It was it was kind of funny. But in Doofus. a very non-comical sort of way. Um, so the ships gather, and we get to see the big forces facing off against each other. We get Kira and Atherin locking into the meteors. Now, to put this in perspective, this is the final battle. And I was like, I look over at Archimedes, I'm like, wait, is this the final battle? We got like 45 minutes left. Really? I mean, like, I, I like big epic battles, but it doesn't feel like this was built up to it all. It feels like it just kind of started. And it did. And It just kind of starts. Uh, our overpowered heroes are given even more power. Mm-hmm. With the meteors, for those that have never seen these things... They're giant missile... They they're, have more missiles in them than a Macross jet. They're weapons platforms that the already overpowered Freedom and Justice plug into. It. <sighs> they just wipe the field of everything in front of them. And honestly, there was even that one moment where, like, Atherin's grunting when he had to do something. Like, you barely had to push a button to make that happen, didn't you? You lazy son of... <laughs> Luna launches from the Minerva, and, um, well... And she goes after the, uh, Eternal, and where her sister is, uh... Yeah, Marin has become the, uh, comm operator there. But she's still wearing her Zaft uniform. (laughs) So, at this point, Luna gets this big, uh, you know, attack of her conscience. Conscience. And, uh... And it's like, do I, am I really doing the right thing? And the problem with this is the fact that we have spent no time with Luna unless she is having the sex. <laughs> uh, honestly, we've, we've only seen her talk when she's around Shin and when they're both around Rey. It, it, it's horrible for her character because we, we don't know her character. Yeah. As we stated earlier, we haven't spent any time with her, so well, this whole attack of consciousness doesn't uh, affect us at all. We well, don't believe her. Yeah, it's... Uh, I don't remember... Uh, and again, like I was saying before, I don't remember anything about her in the TV series either. So I just feel like there's nothing to her character. I don't know anything about her. And all of these things happening to her right now, I just can't bring myself to care... Because I just don't feel for her because I don't know anything about her. Because all she was was she was the person everyone yelled at in the first movie. And it kind of went downhill from there. Yeah, she had like three lines in the third movie. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. And so she stops herself because she hears her sister. Not really clear if that was through the radio or not. People just kind of shout out and hear each other in space. Yeah, it's not... uh, Something I like about Universal Century was that communication kind of made sense in that show, and you couldn't just, you know, pick a mobile suit and just contact it perfectly clearly. Granted, they did have new type uh, moments Mm -hmm. in UC, and we get a few here. Uh. They use the new type chime. Bing! At least seven, six times in this movie. The first person who does it is Kira. Was it even Kira or was it... I almost want to say it was Ray when he took out Jabril. Uh, it might have been It might have been Ray there. But Kira does it. No, we didn't mention that Ray did it before. As did, uh, as did uh, Mu under the guise of Neo in the first movie. But at least Mu had done the new type ping thing in Gundam Seed. I wasn't a big fan of it there, but at least it had been established before. Yeah, it... And again, 
we haven't seen this actually since the first movie of Sea Destiny. Or if it if we did, it was once and it was glanced over. The how many times it happens here is just so distracting. And, and having Kira do it is really frustrating because he's already the ultimate coordinator. I mean, he's been given Mary Sue powers in the first series, and now he's a new type too. What are new types in Seed? We never will get that answer. No. Oh, hey, speaking of which, with all this new type stuff, you know what else? Mu has funnels on the Akatsuki now. Yeah, he does. I, I, like, see, all this stuff gets thrown at us in these last couple battles out of absolutely nowhere. Mu actually gets to relive his dying scene uh, from Seed, where he, he goes up... And he blocks a giant beam coming towards the uh, the bridge of the Archangel. And it's great because it's like he remembers the moment when he died. And I was I kind think... of waiting for him to call, hey, this really is BS. Hey, man, I really did die. Who'd have thunk it? Man, maybe I should just blow up here. No, he doesn't. No, he doesn't. He just takes out the uh, Minerva's main Told gun you instead. I make the impossible possible? Shut up. Yeah. You're dead. But again, uh, the rest of the, the rest of this fight is supposed to be huge. But it doesn't feel it doesn't huge feel at all. Huge. Um, it's going by too easy. It is really what it comes down to. Like Zaft had the overwhelming advantage, and the three ships alliance has shown up, and they are just plowing through them. Zaft doesn't have any adequate defenses. Now, are we at the merry-go-round? Is it? We are we are right at the merry go <sighs> Um We we've given this affectionate nickname to the sequence of final duels that we get here. And uh we don't agree with most of the setup. Okay, so we start off and I was writing these down as fast as they were happening. We get Kira versus Shin. The okay. battle that we've been wanting. Athrin versus Ray. A valid battle because, you know, Ray was trying to get Athrin out of the picture, and he actually has a legitimate reason for wanting to fight and possibly kill Ray. Ray versus Kira. Suddenly that comes in, and it's like, wait, 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 what? There's no reason these two should be fighting. Okay, so he kind of looks like Rao. That's not motivation. These two have never fought before. Luna versus Athrin. Okay, well, you see, in the TV series, this kind of made sense because Luna was crushing on Athrun, but that never happens in the movie, so there's no emotional weight here. Shin versus Athrun. Shin comes in after Luna is stupid, loses an arm and a leg, and rather than, you know, calling them Minerva and getting a new set of arms and legs like Shin would have, she just sits back and lets uh, Shin in the Destiny fight the Infinite Justice. Kira versus Rao? Um, oh, and Ray, uh, Ray decides that he's Rao now, and yells out loudly that he is Rao Le Creuset. Oh, where do we even go with these battles? I, I mean, we were, like I was saying before, Kira versus Shin makes sense to me. I mm -hmm. like the idea of two Gundam pilots who we both, we want to like both of them, you know, squaring off because they have different ideals. But Shin has fallen so far from what he used to be. He has lost all intensity in his fighting. We used to call him Mad Dog. Now he's a puppy. It, yeah, it's sad. He's just kind of like doing things and stupidly doing things. Remember, again, how we were talking about how with the Impulse, he would use every weapon on it to its absolute advantage. He doesn't do that with the Destiny. Uh, Where my sword? Shoot my gun. He mostly just swings swords stupidly in hopes that they hit. I mean, he or kind of he, forgets that he has a particle cannon on his back. Or he uses the shining finger. <laughs> yeah, he's got his G shining finger. Of... Great nod to G Gundam. A much better si Oh, I shouldn't oh, say that. Oh, lord. No, it's true. But to, to end his fight, um, uh, he goes in to attack Athrun with the shining finger. After he... getting his sword cut in half. Dummy. Luna goes in to block him, saying, like, we've got to stop this. Again, both, both of you stop. Kind of completely out of nowhere. And she was separate from Shin and Ray for, like, five minutes. Like, 
Maybe in movie time, maybe like an hour or two tops. That would be a long time. <laughs> oh man. And and Shin at this moment is going into like his last crazy mode. It's like he's trying to tap into his mad dog. But instead he's just a, a yelling idiot. And he almost kills Luna. Honestly. Uh, thankfully Atherin does a spin kick, uses the blades on the heels of his suit, and takes Shin out. Uh, not before Shin tries to catch Beam Saber Blades. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which was honestly really dumb. So, to conclude this wonderful merry-go-round of musical chairs, um, Ray, Ray gets taken out by Kira after telling him to live his own life instead of the clone of Rao. They, they have a funnel fight for a little bit, but I've never seen a funnel versus funnels fight that was so amazingly boring. <laughs> Shin is obviously taken out, and Luna goes crying after him. Um... We cut back to the ships, the Minerva versus the Archangel. The Archangel decides to do a barrel roll and spins over the top of Minerva, shoots down at it, and this Minerva gets rocked. Then Athrin uh, sends his doofy backpack of doom barreling through their engines. Yeah. And the Minerva's pretty the Minerva's... soundly scuttled. The uh, at this point. The plants, Durandal's crew, they're out of heroes. They have no champions left. It is completely one-sided. None of our heroes on the Three Ships Alliance have been taken out. Like, one of the doms got hit. In the leg. Mm-hmm. Oh, no! The, the thing that really bugs me, I mean, like, I was saying no heroes when we were watching the movie, but as the fight continued... There weren't, it didn't even look like there were any other mobile suits on the field. True. Now it, it's like just the the Three Ships Alliance against the super weapons. And those don't really put up any a fight. They're pretty easy to dodge, apparently. Uh, Mu and uh, Atherin take out the, uh, the Requiem Cannon on the moon, and Kira jumps in a meteor and just dismantles the Messiah like it's nothing. And Durandal's like pretty pissed at this point uh at the same time shin kind of parks himself on the moon and luna uh he he has a uh a, a kind of new type moment where he sees stella again and she keeps telling him that she'll see him tomorrow and i'm not sure what that means because he he lives and she does not but um maybe she means like tomorrow is in the future i'll go with that hopefully the um the other thing we noticed during this new type scene in particular, well, probably because he's naked, is the, uh, he's getting ghosts to sex. <laughs> but, uh, the, the thing we noticed is that he looks younger. Like, he looks he, super young. He looks really young. Like, younger than Benajer in Unicorn, which is weird. It, like, drops him from about 16, 17, to about 14. He actually looks kind of like he did during the flashback at the beginning, or at, of the, well, in the first movie. I want to say at the beginning of the show, but we didn't get that at the beginning of the movies. Um, mm -hmm. Of when his family died. That's yeah. That's kind of what he looked like. It, it, he just looks so young, and maybe that's the movie's way of say, showing how much he's reverted. <laughs> I don't know, that's giving him a lot of credit. I don't know. He wakes up, Luna's there with him, and they cry on the moon. On to each other. To sex probably would have followed, but they're in space. So, you know, I, I imagine the Shin from earlier in the series, like, waking up, seeing Luna there, shaking off, and then asking to take impulse, then, you know, jumping in the core splendor, and... Yet again, getting a new, like, top and leg unit and continuing the fight with Impulse. But not this Shin. He's just so housebroken. He's... He's a puppy. I Again, we've established that Impulse has these extra parts. I don't know why we're not using any of them. Because the show's ending. 
<laughs> right. Yep. That would make things interesting. So Kira sneaks into the Death Star <laughs> and gets all the way up to Durandal, who's in a room that's now dark. So now it really looks like mm. uh, Palpatine's throne room. And they have this interesting standoff where they talk about their ideals and who's right and who isn't. Oddly, Kira pulls the gun first. I thought that was interesting. Yeah, it, it's, it was also interesting with Kira shooting guns outside of his suit because honestly he'd be shooting to maim if he stuck with his normal habits of shooting limbs and stuff. That's kind of disturbing. <laughs> yeah. But, um... Atherin also gets out and tries to follow... Honestly, Atherin's the last one to show up because before... Oh, him, yeah, that's right. Before him, Ray shows up. And then Talia, of uh, the Captain Minerva, had her ship abandon crew. Um, had her crew abandon ship. And uh, then came after Durandal. Uh, kind of like... She's been a really good captain up until now. And then we get this. Better than Muru. <laughs> a lot better than Muru. And now suddenly she's just stupid. I don't know what happened, but she became stupid. I think she wanted to sex. <laughs> <laughs> That's usually the only explanation for everything in this movie. Which is why we keep pointing it out. Um, there's this giant, like, five-way Mexican standoff. And, uh, and it ends with one of them. I think it was Ray. Shoots Durandal. Yeah, Ray shoots Durandal. Because Kira's... Because Durandal asking legitimate questions like, you know... Now, I don't agree with Durandal's total uh, dictatorship. That's evil. But mm -hmm. he says things to Kira like, So, you know, if everything gets all screwed up again because you decided to bring chaos from my perfect order, what are you going to do? And Kira's like, we'll deal with it. That's what we do. Did you see Seed and then see Destiny? That's what we do. If we come back, we fix everything. And then Ray's like, he's got a good point, and shoots him. And Ray has this existential meltdown. Uh, he's crying. He's crying. I, I, I don't know how he reverted into a small child crying for his mommy, literally. That happened to, like, everyone on the Minerva. <laughs> But I'm yeah, <laughs> Atherin is just standing there. Like, why he even came in is completely questionable. Especially since in the original Seed Destiny TV series, in the original cut, Atherin was not there. We should clarify that Seed Destiny has had three endings now. Because the, the 50 episode series had its original ending. That ending was considered so bad. displeasing to the fans. It was so bad that they actually made an hour-long director's cut episode called Final Plus, where they made really weird cosmetic changes, but didn't change the overall ending of the movie. Athrin, the big difference are, is are that the fights last a little longer, and Athrin comes in with Kira. The, the point of having Kira be the one to confront Durandal. This is the first time these characters are meeting. Granted, that happened in Star Wars. Yeah. Maybe they're trying to do an homage. An oh. Homage. A homage. A homage. Uh, it's gotta yeah, be a that's, homage. That's so my. That's that's too much crap. The only reason we can come up with for Kira being the one to fight Durandal, <laughs> fight, uh, is that Durandal wanted Kira dead. Plain and simple. That, and even that, in the movies, that plot point isn't really followed up that well on. Because, I mean, it's even worse, because in the movie, we have the scene of Durandal being like, yeah, Shin is perfect to be my Kira killer. And then after uh, Impulse takes out the freedom the first time, he never follows up on that. You know, send in the destiny to take him out. Doesn't happen. No. The Atherin and Kira run off. Uh, right, uh, Talia... Goes up and is you know, cradling the dying Durandal. Suddenly she's suicidal for some she's reason. She's like, I want to die with him. Ray, come over here. You poor boy. Now, rather than stopping this insane woman and this man-child from letting themselves die with this bleeding dictator, Kira and Atherin just leave. She had a gun. <laughs> <laughs> I, get, I, I don't even know anymore. This hurts. 
Uh, as a last request, and it never pans out to anything, is uh, the cap Talia asks uh, Kieran Athrin to tell Muru to look after her son, who we've seen twice in the same animation as a picture that she keeps in her pocket. I'm actually convinced that her son is actually dead, and she is speaking of a grave somewhere. I, I have no but, idea. But again, uh, this is never explained or explored like every other good idea in this series we get a lot of exploration of the stupid ideas that's for sure so uh you know Athrin and Kira make it out of there place is blowing up and we get a nice actually conclusion for the battle uh in the original cut it was we ended with Kira like flying out of there yeah we, we see Kira flying out and roll credits that's it. We saved the day. In in this version, we get to see the ships. Uh, Lacus making the call because she's God and everyone listens to her. That uh, we've won the day. We are withdrawing, and everyone else should do the same. There's an admittedly pretty scene of um, as Lacus' song "Fields of Hope" plays in the background. Um, the ships start sending out signal flares. And you see um, the flares going up from the perspective of Luna and Shin on the moon. And it's like fireworks. And uh, their reaction is they're still like really sad about the whole losing the war thing. And we're still really sad about the whole this movie thing. <laughs> and so it's like, that's my consolation. You get fireworks. Yeah. Thanks. And... Now, the movie itself, it has an epilogue. We'll get to our own in just a moment. Uh, and we get to see uh, Athrin, Marin, Luna, and Shin are going to visit uh, a grave. The, the memorial site the, the for the war. The memorial site for the war. And, uh, and they're placing flowers there. And, and, and they brought back something that we were so happy that they got rid of. It was Shin's sister's cell phone. It, he obsessed over it in the TV series. To, to the extent that it controlled him. And it, it hurt him so much that he could not get past it. Remember how we were talking about how cool it was that it wasn't really in the last movie? They just shoved it in our face a lot in this movie. They brought it back. Like blue jeans or something. I don't know. Uh, this epilogue sucks. So then uh, Kira and Lacus show up and, and to place their own flowers. And Athrin actually introduces Shin to uh, Kira. Now, the first time they met was at this memorial site, but they, Shin didn't know who Kira was at the time. And for some reason, he didn't recognize Lacus. I don't know. He's dense. You must not be very religious. And uh, I, I thought it was an interesting moment. Uh, kind of thrown in too late again. But Too late? In a Destiny movie? I no. know. But uh, I thought it was a neat moment because now Shin you know, realizes this is the guy that he wanted to kill. And it's just the one dude that he ran into one time. Uh, so... A fun idea, not greatly executed. They shake hands in the end. And a after they offer Shin a job, well, we wanted a crazy guy on our team, so you want the job? We're going to go out and kill some more people. I don't know. What's there left to do? Um, actually, we, are, we get that answer during the closing credits. Yay. Well, we should. I guess we should talk about the way that they exit before closing yes. credits. Yes. Um... Now, again, there, there are six of them, uh, three boys, three girls. So we see Lacus and Kira, obviously, you know, kind of snuggling. Because they're a perfect off. couple. They're the perfect couple. Forever. Forever. Then we see Atherin and Marin walking off together. Boo! Now, this leads us to believe but not want to believe that he has given up on Kigali. Horrible because they had amazing chemistry 
and no reason to split up. They had one of the only well-written Gundam romances. Dear God. Gundam Seed Destiny is really good at tearing stuff apart, isn't it? <laughs> Including homes. Apparently. We like to, at least, I'm going to say, he was just giving Marin a ride home because the last pair to leave was Shin and Luna, and we all know that they were going to have to sex. Oh, totally. Which Marin probably didn't want to be part of. Hopefully? <laughs> Well, I can probably find you a doujin that says otherwise, but... Um... Internet is for porn. <laughs> uh, also, as far as people shacking up with each other, uh, at the beginning of Sea Destiny, we had Walfelt and Muru living together. We commented on this earlier, <laughs> that they were like developing a, a decent relationship. Well, now Walfeld is sitting at his place, and we have Muru and Mu. And looks like they're at the same place! <laughs> It's like Mu and Muru are moving in with Walfelt, who feels so bad for that poor guy. Because now he's alone with just his coffee. And maybe DaCosta. And, and, and the only, again, possible love interest in his life is with some other dude in the same house. Oh man, that's gotta suck. And that could be a more compelling story, that's for sure. Oh. He had four lines in the entire... Four movies. Yeah. Four yeah. Well and he's and you know what? He stole Stella's Gundam and nothing ever comes of it. We never see that stupid thing again. Yeah. Ah. After that, uh, Kagali is running the show at Orb. Uh, we see Kira in a Zaft uniform. Yeah, so now Kira has served on every military in this universe. That's weird. He's a player. Athrin is, uh, on the other hand, a switch to the orb uniform. It's like they... Though he switched. doesn't seem to be st spending any time in orb. I don't know. Silly. And and Shin is still in his uh, dress reds with Zaft. Um, <laughs> he and Luna make it to the this big old shindig. He's allowed to sit with the cool kids, so Izak and Diarka are there, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and we finish with... Like, people bowing as Lacus walks down this aisle to... The Plant Supreme Council. So I think we can conclude this with... Lacus is God, people are sheep. Dictators are bad, unless they're Lacus. Unless they're cute. What was fun, though, was that, like, so Kira shows up, like, leading the military entourage, and Lacus is there, like outside the chamber waiting for things to start and then she runs up and hugs Kira and everyone looks shocked and terrified that the leader of the military is shacking up with you know the leader of the of the political side of things I mean I think that's scarier than Duranos yeah plan and this is what they leave us with this is the official end of Sea Destiny thank god I just don't even know how to begin here. There are no more uh, Xeon Mobile Suits of the Week, though. There's nothing else. I think we're just going to... We're going to record an epilogue. And, uh... With our thoughts for the entire series, both as where it stands in the Gundamverse and other things about it. And it's value to pop culture. But for right now, I think it's safe to say this was the worst of the movies. This might be one of the worst Gundam movies ever. One and a half. Yep. I... <sighs> barely one. Barely. It's not even... It. There's no way to justify a movie this awful. And, uh... I, I can't believe the shockwaves it had on Gundam. And we'll get into that in the video to come. So for now, keep on spocking in the free world. And uh, we look forward to sharing our final thoughts.